Welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society's monthly Zoom seminar, Seeding Demystified, with Master Gardeners Judith Dean and Virginia Martin. It will last approximately 60 minutes and be recorded. Following the presentation will be a question and answer session. Submit your questions during the presentation by clicking on the chat box icon. A few days after the presentation, you will be emailed a link to the recording and an evaluation form to provide feedback. Before we start, a little information about what is happening at the Arboretum Society. Our nursery in San Mateo Central Park is open 11 to 2 on Saturdays and Sundays. Enter the North Gate and wear a mask. Payment is by credit or debit card and Apple Pay. No cash is accepted. We are monitoring the COVID situation and following all safety protocols. Check our website, sanmateoarboretum.org or call 650-579-0536, extension two for up-to-date information. While you're in Central Park, visit the Rose Garden, Butterfly Hummingbird and our new Sun and Shade Demonstration Gardens. All are maintained by the Arboretum Society volunteers. In addition, there is an outdoor artist exhibit open 10 to 3 Friday through Sunday in the Arboretum Society's Victorian Garden. Today's presenters, Judith Dean and Virginia Martin, will teach us the basics of growing from seed along with some tips and hacks that make it cheaper and easier to be successful. We will start first with Virginia. Welcome, Virginia. Just a moment. That'll have to do. Um, as Meister Gardeners, our goal is to teach the public good gardening practices. And normally we do that by giving lots and lots of classes. Unfortunately, this year we have not been able to do that, but we have been giving lots of Zoom classes. So um, I'm afraid the screen, my screen is not coming up as it should be, sorry. There we go. Um, we will be giving lots of classes via Zoom. So I encourage you to visit our website, which is pictured and um, check out the the classes provided, and you may find one that you like. Uh, we also, our helpline is up and running. This is a, a phone that you can call or email or text with your gardening questions. So I encourage you to do that. Now I'm going to hand it over to Judith. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm really Happy to be here today. I want to thank the Arboretum for inviting us and giving us an opportunity to spread the good word about growing things from seed. Um, I want you to know that because my training is for the San Francisco Bay Area, I really only will be answering questions from the Bay Area. Uh, it's very specific sometimes to grow from seed and I want you to get good information. So I recommend if you're out in the San Francisco Bay Area, there'll be a master gardener for your county. Just Google master gardener in your county name and it should pop up. And I think you'll get a better answer that way. But thanks for watching and I hope you get something out of the um, presentation. So seeding demystified. And the reason the title is because some people think it's really hard to grow stuff from seed, but I think it's fun and interesting. Seeds, uh, growing from seed, for one thing, is very economical. If you really want to have a whole row of impatience across the front of your house, going to the nursery and buying a flat of impatience will set you back quite a bit, but you can grow a flat for the price of a packet of seed and some soil. There's lots of selection for varieties, and uh, some varieties are not practical for commercial production. You'll be able to grow them. And you can save seed from a favorite plant and reuse them uh, in your garden or get some from friends. We always start with making a plan. You kind of need to know what you're trying to do. Are you gonna grow vegetables or flowers? Does your family actually like vegetables? And 
or not. And if they like them, then which ones do they like? You can take a flyer on one or two vegetables that your family's not fond of in the hope that getting it nice and fresh from your garden will make a difference. But if your family doesn't like zucchini, don't plant zucchini. You will have zucchini forever. And I think you'll find you'll be happier if you plant what your family likes. If you're preserving your produce, you might want to plant a little more than normal. And the other reason you might want to plant a little more than normal is there are lots of food pantries around the peninsula that would really, really like very much to have any excess produce that you are able to give them. You can get the name of a local food pantry by contacting Master Gardeners. We have a list that covers the, um, San, the San Mateo, San Francisco Bay Area counties, and that'll help you find the one that's closest. You have to think about where you're gonna plant. You can grow in pots. Lots of vegetables succeed in pots and or in the ground. An important thing though is, do you have sun? Uh, most crops that bear fruit, tomatoes, eggplant, zucchini, they need sun. You can grow leafy crops like lettuce, spinach, um, things like that, where there's not so much sun, but anything that's gonna make fruit pretty much needs a lot of sun. Once you put your, your plan together, you need to think about what can I plant this month? This um, is probably completely unreadable on your screen, but since you'll be getting a copy of it, you'll be able to look at it. And, and there's one actually for the uh, coastal areas as well that Master Gardeners can give you if you ask for it. So you look down the month and see, well, what can I plant this month? What's gonna be successful? And that's a start. You need to gather some supplies. You need, first of all, to think about soil. That's really basic. If you can start, I would start using commercial seed starting mix if this is your first time around, just because it makes it easier on you and you have more guarantee of success. With the soil, it's really important that your soil be as close to sterile, sterile is wrong, but really clean. Um, Judith, could I jump in here? I, we're not seeing your slides. Are you sharing them? Oh, wow. Thank you, Kevin. What is wrong? Share your screen. Yeah, that's my problem. I'm sorry. Okay. Oops, here we go. Okay. There you go. I always do something new every time. Someday I'm going to get them all right, and I can just quit doing this because it'll be it'll be a miracle. <laughs> so, um, if you want to make your own, uh, you can see the formula here on the screen: a third sand or vermiculite, a third peat moss or coir, and a third pasteurized soil or compost. Garden soil generally has a lot of healthy, good things in it, but it also does have some things that are really kind of a problem for seedlings. So I would, if I couldn't do anything, I couldn't get any commercial seedling mix, I would use potting mix before I'd make my own. Uh, I think that you'll find that you just have more success that way. Now you need a container to put your seedlings in and this is where uh, you can have some creativity. This little pot here is made from a newspaper that's folded up using some origami techniques to make a little box. And in the references at the end of this show, you'll see a link to a YouTube video that'll show you how to do it. Kind of fun and it's a good thing for kids who can get into it. The next one is some uh, paper that came from a shopping bag and was rolled up to make a little container. And the last one over here on the far right, that, is uh, what once held mushrooms from good old Trader Joe's. And I just punched holes in the bottom and used it. You could reuse a lot of different things, Dixie cups, whatever, so that you don't have to go out and buy new containers. Just be sure they're nice and clean. A few other things are helpful. Um, you can, you'll be happy to have a pencil or a chopstick on hand. Uh, I can, tell you why in a little bit. 
another good thing that you need on hand are labels. Um, it's important to know what you planted. All little seedlings look remarkably alike and you can't tell one tomato from another tomato unless you've labeled them. So have something you can use to label with. And you can also, you'll need something to pick up your seedlings with to move them on to another uh, planting area. And I like to use this little plastic uh, fork from some picnic we had at some point, but there's also a tool called a dibble, which is this little funny teeny shovel guy, you could use that. Another thing that's helpful, but a little harder to find is this nozzle for your hose called a fogget. And the fogget puts out a very fine spray that does not dig up your seedlings. Um, and then on the right, you see something that says jump start. What that is, is a heating mat because most seedlings want heat to germinate and you can have much better germination rate if you have some bottom heat. You'll still get something if you don't have a seeding mat. It just will take a little longer and you might not get quite as many things to germinate. I, the way I like to do it is I have made up these little mini greenhouses and they're cobbled together from various things, plastic containers that I got for other purposes. So the big black plastic bin, I forget what came in that, but that is something to hold some water. Then you see the mushroom container with the soil in it there. And on the right, you see that's a shoe box that I turned upside down to act as a humidity dome. So, so we really recommend that you water from the bottom. These little seeds are very easy to dislodge if you water from the top. It's hard unless you're using a fogget to get them uh, watered and it's gonna be a little tough to find that nozzle. So if I were you, I'd stick to bottom watering. So you'd fill this outside black plastic tray. You put your little container with holes poked in the bottom, full of soil in there and let it soak up the water. The way I like to do it is I like to put my soil in and put it in these uh, tray with the water and let it sit for a couple of hours. And that way the soil takes up the water that it needs rather than me trying to guess how much that soil needs. And then once you've finished seeding, you can pop this uh, humidity dome. It could just be a plastic bag. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And put that over your little seedling tray and make it makes a nice humid environment. Part of the trick of getting seeds to germinate is keeping them evenly moist throughout the time they're getting ready to pop their little heads up for you. So that's one way to make it work better. So I'll stop here and ask for questions. Um, okay, Judith, a couple of questions have come in. Uh, one question was about propagating native plants. Is that easily done from seed or do you need to do stem cuttings? It, if I had a choice, I'd go from stem cuttings my experience with native seeds is they can be tricky. Some of them germinate very readily, but a lot of them have specific requirements. Um, some of them even require that a burn has happened in that area. Um, they come up right after a, a fire has gone through an area. So it's a very specialized, no, I won't say very specialized, but it's a specialized thing to grow native seeds. Now, if you have a ready supply of them, why not try it, see what happens. And you could contact the Native Plant Society and they'll give you some help in how to do it. Um, Master Gardeners, we generally propagate from commercial seeds, but uh, the Na Native Plant Society knows a lot about how to make it happen from uh, wild gathered seeds. Mm -hmm. Remember when you gather seeds in the wild to be judicious and don't if it's a plant, there's only one plant there and you're taking all the seeds off it, that's not really a very good idea. Just take what you need and leave some for Mother Nature. Great, thank you, good, good answer. Uh, the second question we have is, how can you grow from seed in an apartment with limited lighting? Oh, uh, that's a challenge, that's a challenge, but challenges are good for us, they make us grow. 
uh, you can find the brightest window you have, although my experience is even the brightest window is not bright enough, to, you can put your uh, little tray of, um, of soil up as close to a light as you can get it. You can buy grow lights. Uh, if you have under lighting in your kitchen, uh, under your cabinets, those are generally LED lights and they're pretty good. And if you could build up a stack of boxes, put your tray up real close, it has to be an inch or two away and you need to leave it on for like 16 hours a day. It's not bright enough. So you really need a, a long way. The light isn't gonna matter until you see germination. So you could germinate and then if you have a way to give it some light after you get them germinated, then you have a little um, more leeway. Well, we have one um, response to the first question about trying to propagate natives from seed. And Edward says that you can get varied results. Seeds from salvias will start easily and others may be season dependent. So a couple of good starting points, but I think the Native Plant Society can give more information too. Yeah, thank you, Edward. It's always helpful to learn a little something about a field I don't know much about. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Thank you. Seeds. You can buy seeds from a nearby nursery. You can buy seeds from online sources and public libraries have started these seed lending libraries. And I know that Menlo Park and Redwood City both have seed libraries. I'm not sure about other libraries. You could call your library and find out. And they're uh, helping share seeds throughout the community, which is, I think, great. Um, I tend to use online sources partly because they are uh, have a lot of information about how to grow those seeds. A seed packet is limited to what will fit on a seed packet. But if you get to the source of those seeds, who, the people who actually grew them for propagation, they'll give you an awful lot of helpful information. And, and I think you'll find that it's a, it's a even if you buy from a nursery, you can still use them for, um, use it for the uh, information that they have. Uh, okay, now my mouse has decided it doesn't want to, oh, there it is, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna have to sit through a little biology here, sorry. So here's a picture of a seed. You can see the outside coat, that's there to protect the um, germ or embryonic plant. Then you can see there's a seed leaf all folded up inside, just tiny, you know, tiny thing. If there's a beginning leaf and there's some source of nutrients for the plant. And then there's the germ itself, the thing that's going to germinate and grow. And I, I think this might give you some ideas when you see this next one. Okay, so we start here. Here's our seed. It's down in the ground. It's nicely moist. It's warm and it starts to grow. And the first thing it tries to do is put out a root because it wants to gather nutrients from the soil to give it more strength. And then it puts this little kinked up green thing. And that's the first thing you see above the soil level. And then finally it raises its head and you get the cotyledon it's called and that pops open and it puts out two leaves. Now those leaves are the leaves that were folded up inside that seed and they don't look like necessarily like the seed that you're going to see when your plant is fully grown. They're just there to give the plant an opportunity immediately to collect some energy from the sun. So that's kind of the, the way seeds get themselves uh, above the ground and, and gathering light. Now this slide is pretty hard to read, but it's here just to remind you that there's a lot of information on the seed packet itself. And take a moment before you launch into seeding to look at it because it's gonna tell you how big is this going to get? Does it want light? Some plants want to be buried so that, some seeds wanna be buried so they're in the dark. Most seeds want light. 
Uh, some of them are going to need to a long time to germinate. Some of them won't take much time at all. It, pretty much everything is on a good seed packet from a reliable place. Again, when you get this slide uh, from the Arboretum, I think you'll be able to read it better. Seeds need the right temperature to germinate and the heat mats are one of the things that provide that uh, temperature and moisture. So plastic wrap, humidity hoods and light and the LED light strips are good. Fluorescent lights work. In a real pinch, you can use regular incandescent lights, although my experience with them has been, uh, they're not really very helpful, but you can give it a try. If that's what you have, that's what you have. And, you know, you, you make do. Um, so I'll stop here. Are there okay. any questions? Yes, we have a couple more. Um, someone mentioned that they bought organic seeds a few times and planted them and never got any germination. And they were not sure what went wrong. Wow. That's really frustrating when that happens because you don't have a clue why it happened. Some of the common problems are that it was kept too wet or too dry. And that's why I like to let the soil sit and gather up the water exactly how much it needs and then cover it with plastic so it stays stable. And you're not guessing every time you water, did I water too much? Did I water not enough? I, I think that's a, generally a good bet that that's the problem. There is also a problem called damping off that I'll talk about later, but that generally happens after the seed pops its little head up. So just not germinating. The other possibility is that seed was not stored properly. You know, sometimes uh, on their way from the uh, vendor to the nursery, they get really, really hot and, uh, or they get frozen and that just kind of messes up the whole thing. So that's a possibility. Um, I just keep trying. Eventually you'll get it. I can't tell you how many times I've had uh, failures. It's not like uh, a, a magic thing. You just have to be stubborn. That's good points there. Um, this next question may have something to do with the first one. They want to know, can you use seeds past their expiration date? Sure, you can use seeds past their expiration date. Um, the likeliest thing is that they're not many, not as many will germinate. So one way to give yourself an idea how many might germinate is to dampen a paper towel, sprinkle four or five, six seeds on it, fold it up, pop the folded paper towel with the seeds in a plastic bag, and then let it stand for however long it says for germination on the packet and open it and have a look. Um, you might not see much right away, but each day have a look. At the end of the germination period that the packet has, let's say the packet says it should germinate in 10 to 15 days. So you start looking at day 10. At day 15, if you still have no germination, I'd go get myself another packet of seeds rather than just be frustrated. But you can look and see and what percentage of those seeds germinated. So let's say you put 10 seeds in there and five of them are starting to show that little white that's the beginning of a root. And you say, ah, so I'm getting about 50% germination from this packet of seeds. That means when you go to seed, put twice as much seed in there. So you should get about the same as if you had a fresh packet of seed. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought you were finished. Um, one more question here. How do seed companies ensure that each seed produces an identical plant or don't they? Oh, what a good question that is. A good seed house spends a lot of time ensuring that their plants come what's called true from seed. Even so, seeds come from sexual reproduction, which means they carry in them 
the um, genetic information from the parent plants, the grandparent plants, and so forth. And there is a chance that they'll call, uh, they will uh, throw out what's called a sport uh, or a chimera. And those are just a technical term for when uh, one of those parent genes broke through. By and large, commercial seed houses are really careful about that and you won't have much trouble. If you saved seed from a tomato plant, we'll say, that you thought was just wonderful, you might be surprised. So with saved seed, you have more chance of getting um, something different than what you saw on the plant itself. To ensure you get exactly what you want, you would use cuttings and you would take Virginia Martin's class on cuttings. <laughs> she teaches a good class on how to grow things from cuttings. Okay, do we have one, time for one more here? Yeah. Okay. Um, they say that seeds that grow taproot vegetables like carrots and radishes should not be transplanted. Now, are there tricks to starting such, she, such seeds directly in the ground? I'm going to talk about direct seeding at the end, but you're okay. absolutely right. There are some things that really do not like transplanting. And um, I think you'll find you have a lot better success if you grow them straight in the ground. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Okay, that's all the questions for now. Okay, thanks. So here we are. We've gathered all our materials. We have a wonderful plan. We're going to fill the containers to the top and then we're gonna tamp that soil down. We don't want any air pockets. We don't want any places where the soil isn't uniformly damp from top to bottom. That's why you wanna water thoroughly before you put your seedlings in. And again, I prefer, and I think Virginia and Kathy would agree, water from the bottom if you, if you can possibly do that. Get your label together with the plant name and the planting date. Um, it's really easy to forget how long ago you planted that seed. And because you're anxious to see that seed come up, you think to yourself, oh, um, I must have planted that a week ago. Well, you only planted it a couple of days ago, but you kind of forgot because you're anxious. So put the planting date on there so you'll know. And then you put your seeds in the soil according to the packet directions. Some of the packets will say cover lightly. Some will say don't cover. Some will say plant so so deep whatever the, the packet says that's what you're going to do then you want to take and press down very lightly on those little seeds um, in order to make sure that they've got good contact with the soil and then you cover it with a plastic or that you know little hood and put it in a bright place but not direct sun Direct sun will just turn your little plastic covered plant into a hothouse and cook. You'll have nice cooked seeds. And that's another possibility that the person that asked about a, a packet that didn't come up, if you get it too hot from putting it under a plastic in the direct sun, that would just cook those seeds and they'll never come up. Now you have the hard part waiting. At least that's the part that's hard for me. I keep going out every day and looking and looking. The seed packet will tell you how long for germination in general, but in a home garden, we can't usually have all the conditions perfect the way a seed house would have. And so they're kind of, in my opinion, they're mostly optimistic about what's gonna happen. I wouldn't get discouraged if it took another several days more than they said on the packet. But um, temperature and moisture are gonna make a difference about how long it will take. If the soil is warm and it has exactly what it wants in the way of moisture, you'll see germination sooner. If the soil is a little dry or the temperature is cold, that plant's gonna take longer to get its act together. And Sooner or later, your plant will pop up and there'll be true, what are called true leaves. So remember the picture that showed you those first leaves that come up, which are the ones that have been stored in the seed itself? Those 
cotyledon leaves, leaves are not true leaves. They are just there to gather the first bits of energy from the sun. The next set of leaves that appear are what are called the true leaves. And those are the ones that look like the plant should look. And that means your plant has really established itself and it probably can use some fertilizer. A little bit of quarter strength solution. You need to be really careful not to blast your blast your um, little seedlings because they're they're very fragile at this stage. So err on the side of more dilute rather than stronger fertilizer. So we're almost there. If you get your plants up to two or three inches and you have true leaves that are large and strong, it's probably ready to pot on to a larger container. And if the plant is large enough and the weather is good, you can transplant it from there straight into the garden. Sometimes you have grown seedlings so that they're really bunched up together and you need to separate them out and put them in a bigger uh, pot for a little while before you put them in the ground. But you can't transplant until you see those true leaves and the plant looks really strong, like it's just growing on thriving on its own. Now you're gonna have to protect them from pests because there is nothing that pests like better than a nice soft seedling. The slugs and snails are just licking their chops at the thought of your lovely seedlings. And surprising enough, birds think they're wonderful. Blue jays come along and just whip those seedlings right out of the ground. And even squirrels will come. And generally, I think they're just mischievous and they want to dig, but, but they can do it too. So I tend to put chicken wire over my plants when I put them in the ground because that keeps the squirrels and the blue jays from getting to them. And I deal with the slugs, however you deal with slugs and snails, either use a, a beer container so they die happy, or you can hand pick them. Uh, you can use snail bait, but remember that you're growing a vegetable that you will eat. And therefore you don't wanna use anything poisonous near your seedlings. So I would advise you, if you're going to use snail bait, put the snail bait at least three or four feet away from your plant. You just don't want any possibility your plant's gonna take up the uh, poison that's in those snail bait. When you're ready to transplant, you have to wait till the late afternoon and you need to protect your little seedling from the direct sun. If you plant in the morning, that seedling has to cope with all day full sun. And it may just be more than the seedling is prepared to deal with. So you give it a chance to settle into the soil all night long. It's drawing moisture out of the soil. It's getting itself, you know, ready to grow in its proper environment. You want to move damp seedlings into damp soil. So you don't want dry seedlings going into a dry soil. That's the worst. And then you think, oh, I'll water it and everything will be fine. Well, yeah, maybe, but look, you've put a lot of work into this. You don't want to give yourself maximum chance for success after that. And the best chance for success really will be put damp seedlings into damp soil. You want to handle your seedlings by the leaves, not by the stem, tempting though that is. A plant has several leaves, but it has only one stem. If you pick up the plant up by the stem, you're putting pressure on the one system that the plant has to bring nourishment up from the roots and to take the energy gathered by the sun down to the roots. So handle by the leaves and check for watering every day until you see that plant is well established. What do I mean by well established? It starts to put out new growth. It starts to put out new leaves. Then you know your plant's on its way and maybe you can cut back the watering a bit and then gradually get it on a normal cycle. So just some pictures to show you some of my efforts at, at doing this. There's a bunch of little four o'clock seedlings that I'm growing four o'clock sort of flowers. Uh, and they're getting bigger here and they're leaning over toward the light. 
and I'm getting even bigger. And now the front part of that little container has started to germinate too. So just sort of see what it looks like. When you go to transplant, here I am with my garden fork, uh, my favorite tool for digging things up to transplant. I've reached in and I've gotten a little fork full and I can just drop that gently on a hard surface and those little seedlings will kind of fall apart to allow you to pick them up by the leaves and put them in the, in the pot that you're moving them to or into the soil. Now here's, here's, here's another set of slides to show you what it's called pricking out seedlings. And I was happened to be using marigolds because marigolds are really easy. And they're useful to grow in the garden because they bring uh, some of the helpful insects that we all need to help keep the bad gut insects down. So the first slide shows you the little clump that I dug up with my, with my garden fork. And the second slide, second picture shows you the size of the root mass there. And then the last one shows you them put out into a pot. Okie doke, time for questions. Um, well, you've been covering everything just so well, we don't have any more questions at the moment, so. Or I bored everybody so much, they've all gone to no. sleep. <laughs> okay, so you had asked about direct seeding. There are seeds that just don't particularly like to be transplanted. And uh, root crops, carrots, and things like that generally are not fond of being transplanted. In fact, some of them just simply can't be transplanted. Another crop that is sometimes it's a good idea just to grow it from seed is um, the um, squash plants. Because if you grow squash plants in a pot and the seeds touch the sides of the pot, it tells the plant, oh, you're done growing and now we'll just, uh, we'll make some fruit. Well, it's probably only got about six or eight leaves on it. It's never going to make you any fruit. So you don't want that, that um, zucchini or whatever you've planted to get the idea that it's time to stop growing. So it's better to put those straight into the ground. If you get seeds, um, Master Gardeners, we try to be very careful when we sell uh, zucchini seedlings to sell them when they're very small, only a couple of leaves in order to make sure you don't run into that problem. But if you buy them from a nursery, I don't know, you have to be a little careful about that problem. Um, and the other things that like it, I'm trying to think now, uh, I found cucumbers like to be direct seeded and beans like to be direct seeded. Kathy, Virginia, do you know other ones you think do better from direct seeding? Well, carrots and radishes, you cannot transplant those. I mean, <laughs> they're just too fragile. Yeah. Um, and other things like some herbs, like, like borage or and things like that, they really need to be direct seeded because they're, they grow really quickly and they would outgrow their pots too fast. Uh-huh. Good. Okay. So um, the way you sow is... You make a very fine uh, soil. So you really crumble up all the clumps. That's hard to do around here because we've got that lovely clay soil. So you'll have to work a little bit, but make sure you do. I'll tell you a trick I use. I go out into my, where I'm gonna plant in the soil and I dig a little cup of the soil out and I replace it with seeding mix or with planting mix and let the little soil act as a pot to hold it. That way this seed gets to start in some nice soft soil. And then when it gets big enough, it'll grow out into the regular soil. It's also useful to cover your seeds um, because you're gonna conserve moisture and you're gonna conserve, you're gonna make it a little greenhouse around them. You can see here on this raised bed, uh, they, somebody took probably milk jugs, cut them in half, took the caps off so they'll ventilate and put one over each of the uh, areas that they seeded. And that works really well. I've done that quite a bit. And I found that it 
just the, that extra protection from um, varmints and from the uh, drying out problem is really worth uh, doing. Once the true leaves emerge from, again, it's just like when you're growing in, in a little tray, uh, the water requirements change. So when you're growing, uh, when the seedlings are in the process of coming up, they need a lot of water, um, either absorbed from the bottom in the case of seed trays or carefully watered around where you're, you've sowed them if it's direct seeding. And then as they come up, you can begin to back off on the water. It's a little water situation is a little easier when you direct sow because there's moisture in the soil where it, when you sow into little pots, uh, you are the moisture, you are mother nature. And again, protecting from weather and pests is important. Our friend, the chicken wire is a good idea. Um, other things I've used is if you get those hanging baskets and you know, the first year they just look so beautiful. And then the next year they start to look a little rattier and rattier and rattier. And finally you think, oh, phooey. Instead of getting a new liner, I'm just gonna get a whole new set. Well, you've got this nice wire um, mesh uh, that held the um, peat liner, pulled up what's left of the peat liner out, tip that over your seedlings, stake it down with whatever you've got to stake it down with, and that'll protect your seedlings from uh, squirrels and uh, most birds. Now we talked about why things don't come up. Damping off, the curse of all of us who grow from seed. Damping off is basically a sanitation problem. You have, it's in the soil and some plant seeds, I think carry it in on themselves because there are some seeds you could plant it in terrible soil and they would come up no matter what. And there are some seeds I will, can't tell you how many times I've tried some seeds and they come up and they look lovely. And then all of a sudden you see them just lying on their side and you think, oh no, damping off. Once you see it in a little tray of seeds, pull everything out because they would just pass it along to anything that's in the neighborhood in that same soil. It's just frustrating as heck. Um, ways you can prevent it you really want to get as quick a germination as you can. Get it past that stage where it's so terribly fragile that anything in the soil can really do it harm. That's one of the reasons I really recommend trying to use a heat mat because heat mats make a big difference in making the seed germinate quickly. You need good germination, good air circulation. It, when you have the hood on, okay, when you're waiting for the seed to pop its head up, Okay, that's great. And now when the seed has popped its little head up, you pull that hood off. So there's air circulation because air circulation seems to prevent the um, damping off from happening. There are antifungal products you can buy that claim that they will uh, prevent damping off. In my experience, none of them work. You may have different results and uh, I may know if you do, because I'd love to be able to recommend a product, but in my experience, once you have damping off, you just, it's game over, start again. Other things that are really a problem, cutworms, earwigs, nails, slugs, all kinds of little things are sitting there waiting for your babies and eternal vigilance. The University of California has a website, uh, IPM stands for integrated pest management and it is a way of handling pests that is less damaging to the environment and if you go on uh, and just google uc ipm you'll get a website that'll give you lots of information about how to deal with the um, with pests and the url for that is in the resource section so now we're up to references and that means we're at an end here, I want to tell you about a couple of these references I have here. Um, one of the th ones that I think is really useful is this last one. 
And that's uh, Janice Moody and Carol O'Donnell's presentation about growing uh, a year round edible gardening on the coast. It has lots of charts that apply to our area. One of the hard things about being a gardener in the Bay Area is we are unique. Our climate, our soil is very different than the rest of the country, even the rest of California. So um, getting information that is about local uh, growing practices is really helpful. So I recommend having a look at that. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, and there's also a slide uh, about saving seed. If you want to do that, that can be kind of fun. Once you get going, you might like to do that. Okay, my cursor has disappeared again. There it is, hello. Um, these are some useful uh, URLs. I'm not going to recommend the products from these three companies because as a master gardener, we don't recommend specific companies. I will take my master gardener hat off and tell you these are companies that I have used and found to be very reliable. And the best thing about them, even if you never buy a thing from them, is they have videos and information that just goes on and on and on and on and will answer a lot of the questions you have. If you really get into it and you become a complete seed geek like me <laughs> and probably Virginia and Kathy too, there's a United, a Un United Kingdom website called theseedsite.co.uk. If there's anything about seeds that they don't have, I don't know what it is. It just goes on and on and on forever. And you can dig around in there and find the answer to a lot of things. And even though it's about uh, the United Kingdom, so it's specific to the growing techniques they use, a lot of it you can apply to, to uh, our area. And this is the URL for making those funny little pots at the beginning out of newspaper. Um, and you, if you click on that, you'll see how to do it. Kind of fun. Thank you for supporting us, San Mateo Arboretum. I had help putting this together originally. Yana Maloney and Terry Messenger helped me put it together. And uh, since then, a lot of other master gardeners have chimed in. Your questions and your evaluation are also helpful because based on that, I can modify some of these slides change my presentation and make it better for the next group of people that come to see the presentation. Thank you for spending time with us today. Here's the, um, the information about how to reach us with your questions. If you don't get all the answers you need today, or if you think of something later. And uh, I can spend a few minutes on any remaining questions. Well, uh, Judith, I have a couple of comments that came through here toward the end. Uh, one was from someone that said they'd heard that a trick for separating seedlings that are all bunched up in a very small container, like 20 leeks in a square inch, uh, <laughs> they said soak them in water to wash away the soil and then you get the individual seedlings. Is this advisable? Well, I suppose you can do it if they if it's a strong seedling. I my feeling is the less you disturb the roots, the better. Those are very fragile roots, and when you wash them uh, in the water, however gentle you are, it's just one more disturbance. So my tendency, and I this is not backed up by science or experiments or anything, is to try not to mess around with those roots. Um, Virginia, Kathy, have you had any experience with trying that? No, I haven't. I haven't either. Uh, I would be concerned about not being able to touch the stem or the root. You know, you have to ha be able to have some leaves to touch, you know, to hold on to. And yeah. might, at that point, they might be just too fragile to do that. Yeah. You know, one of the great things about being a gardener is that you're kind of a citizen scientist. And you can try it. Take uh, a clump of seeds, seedlings out of your growing area and wash their little roots and pop them in a container. And then the rest, you leave the soil attached and pop that in another container and see who does better. And then get back to us. Tell us 
what you found out because it would be helpful for us to know if you had a good experience with that then we'd like to know so we can recommend it to other people uh, but on the whole i'd say stick with the least disturbance is the best yeah. i agree um, there's one more question here from Faith, who apparently lives in Manhattan, New York, <laughs> and she found you somehow here. And she said that uh, being a person that lives in New York, the opportunities are very limited for getting gardening education. What online education sites could you recommend other than YouTube and any communities can you re recommend that she join? What about the master gardeners in New York? <laughs> yep, I'm sure New York has, uh, the, the county has some, uh, some master gardeners. Uh, whether you can grow things, I don't know. Manhattan just sounds like skyscrapers to me, but I'm sure there's some soil somewhere where there's soil you can grow seedlings. Uh, I would contact your local master gardener. And if you go back and look at the slide that I, I put up that had the information about grow organic and territorial seeds and Johnny seeds and look at them, they give lots of information about how to, how to uh, grow the seeds. Uh, some of it is YouTube videos, but some of it's right there in print and they're on their website. And I'd, I'd use that. I think that's a really helpful uh, resource for you, Kathy. Virginia, have you got other thoughts? Well, I was thinking of maybe there's there's got to be an arboretum or something of that nature. Oh wow! Someplace. Absolutely, Wave Hill. I've always wanted to go there. Oh, that's supposed to be a terrific garden, and you might be able to see that. Um, there is a group called the Garden Conservancy. Oh yeah. That I belong to. Their main goal is to save gardens that um, might be lost if the owner either dies or sells the property and uh, there, there's no one there who cares that much about the garden. Here in the Bay Area, Ruth Bancroft's garden over in Walnut Creek is a garden conservancy uh, property and they have managed to save that. Uh, Ruth Bancroft has passed away now, but her garden lives on and courtesy of them. And they do teach some classes uh, so that's a possibility. Yeah. Some nurseries teach classes. Um, that's about what I could think of. Any other thoughts? Well, some of the libraries um, we've gone to as Master Gardeners done presentations at libraries. So to check yeah. out your local library. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think that would that would be a possibility too. But I think starting with your local master gardeners is probably going to give you the, the best information because they'll know all the tips and tricks that work in your area. Every area has its challenges. And if you garden for a long time in the same area, you finally figure out how to deal with some of the issues, I'll call them, that occur in your, in your area. Also, and I don't know much about New York, but I'm wondering if there are any community gardens that she could go to. Oh, that's a good idea. Community gardens are a great place to learn. Um, yeah, I think that would be worthwhile too. If you uh, just Google community gardens Manhattan, see what happens. There may be some. Sounds great. Okay, thank you everybody. I appreciate all your questions and your interest. I hope your questions got answered and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you, Judith, Kathy, and Virginia for that excellent presentation. You gave us lots of information about great tricks and hacks to try. I hope everyone will now be successful in germinating seeds. I know I'm going to try and hopefully be more successful in the future. So, um, there's a question here about uh, sending slides and yes, slides, slides will be will be sent uh, in a day or two along with a recording.
Um, there's another question about flower and vegetable seeds of Virginia or Kathy. Well, can you answer that question uh -huh. about what can be planted now? I just recommended, uh, I put the Master Gardener webpage in the chat. If you go there and look on resources page, we have a month by month uh, calendar of what you can plant. And it depends on where you're living right now. I mean, we have so many microclimates out here. There's hot, foggy, and um, just sunny climates. So check out the website. And if you still need some questions answered, uh, contact the helpline. Very good. So, thank you all. That was fabulous. In Thank a few you. days, you're quite welcome. In a few days, you will be emailed a link to a recording of the presentation and an evaluation form. Any unanswered questions can be addressed at that time. We would appreciate feedback on what worked and where we can improve. Please join us for future seminars and workshops. Our free Zoom seminar on Sunday, July 11th will be start now to grow a year round food garden with renowned local author and plantswoman, Pam Pierce. Join SMAS and receive a discount on our workshops at a variety of nurseries and businesses on the peninsula and 10% of all purchases at the Arboretum's nursery. Also let us know if you're interested in volunteering by signing up on our website, or you can email us at info at sanmateoarboretum.org or calling 650-579-0536. We have a variety of opportunities from working in the nursery, which does include, you know, starting plants from seed and cuttings. So you can learn a lot that way. And also uh, opportunities for maintenance, organizing these monthly seminars and workshops and community outreach. Thank you again to Judith, Virginia and Kathy and to Kevin, our Zoom technical specialist, and to all of you for joining us today. The program is now finished. <laughs>